Well, good evening, everyone. Alan, I know you can hear me. Alan, come and come on in. <laughs> Just kidding. Here, if you're still in the wings, come on in. If we haven't met, my name's Paul. This is my daughter, Ella. Uh, we're very glad to be able to join together and uh, worship together this evening. Um, as folks are coming in, if you, uh, if you haven't already, uh, tonight we're going to be uh, celebrating communion. We're going to be meeting at the Lord's table after the message. So if you haven't gotten one already, there are these uh, all-in-one communion cups, which are very fancy. And so I, it, it has fallen to me to offer you a demonstration. Uh, I failed flight attendant school, but they're, they're letting me do it anyway. Uh, so if you, if you grab one of these, if you just kind of flick the top of it, you'll see that there's a, there's a clear cellophane topper on this thing. So that's stage one. So when the time comes, that's going to be phase one. You'll uncover the wafer that, that way. And then when it's time for juice, you just lift the whole operation, and then we'll miraculously reveal to you juice. <laughs> then we'll be able to partake together. So any questions? Can I speak now or for an older piece? OK, that's thanks. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I practiced all day for that. So that's okay. Awesome. So um, all right, so if I can be serious for a moment. Not that that wasn't serious be more serious still. Um, by way of a, of a call to worship, I wanted to read a few words from, uh, from Nehemiah, which is fun, right? But don't, don't do a lot of Nehemiah in this place. So, so uh, here we go. So from Nehemiah uh, chapter 9, um, through verses 5 and 6, which I will read very closely because I got my glasses on. Whoopsie. Okay. Uh, so where? Prophet Nehemiah writes, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is called, which is, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You've made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve all of them, and the host of heavens worships you. I love this, this picture of a God who uh, creates and is sovereign over all of creation, and yet is embedded and deeply connected to just the most, the most basic things, right? All the things that preserve our life, God's connected to it all. And it's this beautiful picture. And as we gather to worship, I just wanted to highlight that because sometimes we feel like this is kind of a moment to sort of pause and take ourselves out of the, the, of, of, the, of the mainstream of life and do something else to focus on God and each other instead. But really, this is a great way, if you've ever seen the, the, the movie Finding Nemo, there's this scene where, you know, they, they travel on this current and the current is in the ocean. It's just a part of the ecosystem, but it's a way for them to kind of be taken up into something else and for them to get somewhere kind of quickly. And worship is, is that way for us. It helps us to sort of be taken up into this story of God, which is bigger than all of us, and to get connected to God in a way that's free from distraction and free from kind of the everyday hum of life. And so that's what we're doing tonight. We're still in the everyday all the time, and yet we're able to get connected and find a way to, to stay deeper connected to God in our everyday life. That's what this is about. It's about transforming and becoming closer to God and being formed to be more like Christ every day. So would you stand with me, friends? We're going to sing together and pray for just that, for God to be lifted high on our praises and for God to shape us more into the likeness of Christ. Oh, oh, oh. 
tries to roll over my balls the sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know Show you my 
to gather. I have a few announcements uh, for us here today. Um, the executive met this past week and uh, there they were uh, looking at one of the things that uh, was the financials and kind of an overview just to kind of a high top look at it and uh, the giving that has uh, uh, come in through the month of October was fantastic. So thank you one and all for your continued contributions to the river. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. We couldn't do all this ministry without you. We couldn't you know, um, be inspired to know that we're called up into to God's story, as Paul so eloquently uh, spoke here this evening. And so uh, just thank you. Thank you so much for engaging in that way. It is so good. Uh, one of the ways that we engage in God's story is uh, Christmas with Style. It's a program that we have here at the river where we engage um, with the women that find themselves in a shelter during Christmas time. And so uh, Gord Birdie has prepared packages 
Um, did you want to say a few words, or were you just looking to just stand up and wave to everybody so we all know? I am standing. Yeah. Yes, he is standing. <laughs> Somehow I was expecting that. And you delivered. That's awesome. So, um, Gordon has some packages if you uh, want to read up on it, and if you want to take a package out to people that you know that might sponsor uh, this great event. We've done it in the past. Um, this package he gives you will uh, tell you the history, so I won't take too much of that time now. We're going to have lots of announcements, I'm sure, about this in the future. So, um, please take a look at the package and uh, carry it forward from there. Oh, they're at the back of the church? Yeah. And you'll grab one there. All right. Excellent. So, um, at this point, I'm going to invite Judy, um, who's right beside Gord, and she's going to come up, and then she's going to introduce some special guests to us here today. Okay. Is the microphone on? No. It should be on. They should uh, mute it from the back. Hello? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um... It gives me a lot of um, pleasure, actually, to introduce our newest newcomer family to the river, and they are the Maestras. We have been, um, it's been since I look back, and 2018 was when we first had the documents go in. We had hoped to have them here earlier, but um, COVID kind of threw a bit of a wrench into that. So uh, why don't you guys come up? So um, they arrived on October 25th to a beautiful apartment that was decorated, I think, by uh, Michelle and Leslie. So big kudos to them. Um, and um, so without further ado, this is Salwa. Yes. This is... Um, what is your name? Shad. What's your name? Shad. Fabulous. Shad. And what's your name? Christelle. Christelle. <laughs> Camille. Camille. So uh, let's welcome them. Yeah. Let's give them a great welcome. <laughs> so, uh, we're thrilled that they're here, and um, Camille has some words that he'd like to say to everybody. I'm not sure if the kids will be able to last that long, but <laughs> I'll just pass it on to you. Yeah. Well, there's another mic. Ah, okay, so I can just put this down. And there's a stand here. Do you want to use that? No. Do you want to use this? Oh, okay. Just to help you with your hands. Yes. Good evening. Uh, we are so happy to speak to you, and uh, we hope that uh, we can express well in spite of limited language. Uh, we will summarize our experience uh, to three sections. Uh, Syria, Egypt, Canada. The first, uh, Syria, fear and life threat. The war in Syria began in uh, 2011, and I met Salwa and we got uh, engaged in 2014. Salwa and her family moved out uh, of their city, Aleppo, uh, to escape the war. And they moved to my city, Latakia, which I uh, consider a safer than Aleppo. I mean safer, uh, some missiles were uh, falling on the Takia, not many uh, like Aleppo. But between October 2014 to March uh, 2015, like uh, many men and youth, I have been stopped my, many times while in public transportation or while walking in the street to have my name checked to join the military reserve service. So because we thought that we should build our family on safe foundations, not on the fear that we may have to separate by the call up to join the military reserve service, which would, with, uh, with, which would lead to one of two options, either being kept for a long time or death. Therefore, we decided to travel a safer country and we chose Egypt because Salva's brothers and father were in Egypt. 
Number two, Egypt. Instability. In Egypt, work is not permitted for us, but I could work illegally with no contract. So I worked in a music institution uh, just upon a verbal agreement. The salary was very little compared to my efforts. And it hardly covered our monthly house rent and life expenses. Also in the job, there was no insurance, no rights, or clear policies to protect me. In Egypt, we were responsible for everything that concerned our children. The birth, doctor visits, medicine, vaccines, nursery. There was no one to help or support us. In Egypt, we couldn't travel outside Egypt and return because we didn't have a, resident, a residence permit. So we lived in an anxiety, especially if we were asked to return to Syria, and this was impossible for us. In Egypt, before three years, we started together with your church to plan in traveling to Canada, and that was a turning point in our life. I will say something to uh, Judy, Melissa, Haysan, and Gina, that uh, their emails uh, were not normal for us. Each email was a message of hope. We lived uh, the waiting for three years. Of course, COVID-19 increased the time. Our life in Egypt was a difficult period, and the most difficult is what we cannot express in words and we cannot write. Number three, Canada. <laughs> the choice. When Haisa and Gina told us before three years that the church accepted us for the refugee sponsorship program, we asked ourselves, why us? Do we, do we deserve all this? The instant answer was yes, because God loves us. But we said, love, uh, sorry, uh, God loves everyone, and there are many people who suffer like us, and they probably deserve to this program. So why us? When we read the Bible, we notice that God chooses a lot of people. God chose Abraham, Mary, and Paul. In Gospel of John 15, 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. We feel that God chose us to tell us something and to ask us to do something. Perhaps it is not necessary to understand now, but the important thing is to trust him and accept his gift and be ready to listen to him to know what we want, what he wants from us. Maybe he will speak to us indirectly through people of events or events so the next period for us will be to listen to God's word. Finally, we are not here only to say thank you, because we think you don't wait this word, but we would like to say that we feel very well what you have done in every detail from the beginning until now. We feel those who planned, we feel those who donated, we feel those who devoted their time, we feel those who prepared the lovely apartment, we, we feel the children who prepared the nice banner, we feel those who prayed for us, we feel the people whose names we know and whose names we don't know. Uh, God gave us life, but you changed our life. Mm -hmm. 
when uh, we moved to uh, Egypt, we remember the escape of Ali family to, to Egypt. And uh, in Egypt, uh, Christian and, or Copt in Egypt, uh, Egypt uh, are very proud that the Holy Family uh, visited uh, them in the past. And we, we visit uh, the museum of uh, Cairo, we see a, a map that depicts uh, the path of uh, Holy uh, Family journey. So uh, we, will, we would like to, to give you a small souvenir to your church, uh, the path of the Holy Family in Egypt. Excellent. Thank you so much. We'll have to make this available so that um, more and more can uh, have a look through it as well. Don't leave yet. And if uh, Charles could come on up. Charles? 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 <laughs> We're just going to take a moment to... Uh, here, I'll take that. It's, uh, I'm not going to stand up there too well. We're just going to take a moment to pray for you. Um, and I just wonder if there are others here that would like to join me in prayer. Uh, you can lay hands on them. Um, you can extend your hands from where you're seated. Maybe there's others that wish to uh, also say a few words. I would invite you to uh, take one of the mics uh, or, or maybe just speak um, plainly. That would be good. Yeah, come on up. Anybody else? Maybe just move a little bit forward. Just stand a little forward so people can uh, stand behind you. Excellent. More? Come on in. All right. I don't know if anybody, does anybody want to say a few words? If you do, just grab the mic now. Otherwise, just speak out loud. Okay. Let's just take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, wow, we are in awe. Uh, we are in awe of you and the stories that, that you have written. Uh, both those of... Uh, Jesus and family going into Egypt and then coming out and, uh, and Lord and now hearing about uh, Camille and Selwa and Charles and Christelle and their journey from Syria, this, this uh, place of war, this, this place of uncertainty and then to move into Egypt where there was instability, Lord, you were with them. You were with them in that time, and, and now to bring them here to Canada. Lord, we thank you that you have uh, brought them here. We thank you for their stories. We thank you that their story is now becoming one with us and our stories here. Uh, Lord, we look forward to our stories blending in as we blend into your story and what it is that you have called for us, for each and every one of us. So, Lord, we pray for this family. We pray that you would give them grace and everything they need to settle well into Canada. Uh, that, that all of the details would come together just super well. And that they would be blessed, perhaps blessed beyond measure that, that they would know. Bless them with whatever it is that they stand in need of, whether it's uh, work or play, uh, schooling, or um, it just Lord, all the things that are needed for them to settle in well. We thank you for them. We thank you for their testimony. We thank you for the river who has been supporting them these last three years and have you know, just uh, behind the scenes just kept praying and hoping and waiting for the day for them to arrive. And here it is. So, Lord, we give you praise. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else that wishes to say a few words? God, I just, uh, yeah, I just thank you for them. I thank you for the safe journey, their safe arrival. Um, thank you so much for the people that um, have supported them, specifically uh, Judy and Gord and uh, Melissa, and um, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm sure there's other people, uh, many who are involved in, in having them settle in. And so God, we just thank you that, um, that they're here. We just pray, yeah, your blessing upon them. We look forward to getting to know them. Uh, God, we look forward to what you're going to do and how you're going to use them. Um, and, uh, yeah, we just uh, look forward to, um, yeah, many days ahead as we get to know them and their, uh, their kids. And we just uh, thank you for that and for them.
Lord, we offer uh, all this praise and prayer to you. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace, that which you have bestowed upon the mistress, and that which you bestow upon us here at the river. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> all right, so the children are uh, going to be released to go to uh, Sunday school. Uh, even the ones that were going to be uh, in the nursery are going to be taken downstairs, and they have enough volunteers today to, to make it happen. I believe it's going to be a movie extravaganza. And so um, maybe you saw some of them walking around with uh, tickets, and these tickets are so that they can purchase some goodies downstairs. So can I hear $5? Anybody? $5, $5. Hey, what? <laughs> Uh, if you were to go down there and help out, you might be able to participate too. But uh, we're just so thankful for Andrea and all of her efforts um, here in Sunday School. And uh, yeah, just uh, looking forward to good stories coming out. They're going to be uh, down there and mingling after the service, so you're invited to check it out as well. So over to, over to you. Here we are in the second installment of uh, The Unlikely Ones. It's a, a series, it's only three uh, messages uh, long, uh, but here we are in the middle of it, and the second one, uh, where we're looking at overlooked and perhaps misunderstood characters in the Bible and what it is that they might have to teach us um, here today. And so, um, yeah, we look forward to diving into that here this, uh, this day. So please join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, the word stories come to mind again. Uh, and so as we look at the, a story here in a history that you wrote, uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, this story would speak to us, that it would inform us of who we are and who you are and how all that comes together for us here now in the 21st century. Lord, thank you for being uh, the God of the stories in whose story we find ourselves. Amen. All right, so at the beginning of the movie Braveheart, it has this phrase that is spoken. It says, history is written by those who hang heroes. This is quite a stark quote to start a story of uh, William of Wallace. It's an eye-opening statement. And it alerts me to the idea that others have differing perceptions of events that have unfolded. So, in the history of the Israelites, we find the story of David and Goliath. So, what about Goliath? What might Philistine history have to say about Goliath? How did they depict him? Was Goliath a hero in the eyes of his countrymen? Was Goliath a hero whose story was written by the Israelites? Good questions worth pondering. Israel had their own version of a Goliath some 40 or 50 years before young David's time. Israel's giant of a man lived during the time of the Judges. And his story is found in the book of Judges, chapters 13 to 16. Samson. Samson was a giant in his own right. Samson. A likely or unlikely hero. 
Well, let's find out, shall we? But first, let me show you a quick overview of the Samson story. You know, Judges 13 to 16, perhaps you have a pre-read it at home. For those of you that are taking this in, you can pause and you can start to read chapters 13 to 16. Or maybe you have already. There were some announcements and encouragement that went out this past week saying, please read Samson's story for tonight. But here, let's watch this overview of Samson's story. I'd like to tell you about a fella, the guy was really strong. Samson was an Israelite who never got along. God gave him a mission, God said don't cut his hair. When Samson came a-coming, there was trouble everywhere. One day a lion jumped me, so I grabbed the vicious beast. When the fighting was all finished, the lion was deceased. The Philistines had captured Israel, but God devised a plan to rescue all the Israelites, and Samson was his man. Don't forget Samson, though you're big and strong Your power isn't just because your hair is long God give you your strength, you got a job to do God is gonna do a mighty work through you I caught 300 foxes, and once the tails were tied I set them all on fire, until everything was fried The Philistines got angry We thought we'd take him down I killed a thousand of them with a jawbone lying around God was using Samson, Samson had a vice He hung out with evil women if he thought that they looked nice I show like Delilah, I want her as my bride I promise to be faithful and to never leave your side Don't forget Samson, though you're big and strong Your power isn't just because your hair is long God give you your strength, you got a job to do God is gonna do a mighty work through you They gave her lots of money to see what made him strong Every time she tried to trick him, she found that she was wrong Until the never-ending nagging, I could no longer bear I told him about my secret, that my strength was in my head When Samson was asleep, she shaved his hair till it was gone When awoken by the Philistines, Samson wasn't strong the Philistines are now upon you, I shouted out with glee We poked Samson's eyes out so that Samson couldn't see Samson, you were big and strong Your power wasn't just because your hair was long God gave you your strength, you got a job to do God's still gonna do a mighty work through you They threw me in prison and made me grind grain. Then they threw a huge festival to the false god Dagon to celebrate my capture. When they brought me out to make fun of me, they didn't notice my strength came back. And guess what else Ooh, came back? Let me rest between the pillows. Did something start to shake? What is Samson doing? Watch the pillows break! The place began to crumble. Thousands now were dead. God did it with a fellow with long hair upon his head. Don't forget Samson, he was big and strong. His power wasn't just because his hair was long. God gave you talents that he wants you to use. God is going to do a mighty Samson. We know that Samson was a Nazarite, set apart by God to serve God, set apart to reflect God, to reflect a life devoted to God. And from the Bible, we also know that Samson was quick, and he was strong, and he was witty. These are attributes that make Samson memorable, but do they make him a hero? Well, let's take a closer look, shall we? Samson was quick. Who do you else do you know that could catch 300 foxes, let alone one fox, and then tie their tails together, put a torch in, in the knot, and then set those 150 pairs of foxes with the torches, uh, putting the, all the fields to ablaze? I mean, he was quick. Samson was strong. He killed a lion with his bare hands. He killed 30 men for their clothes. He carried the gates of Gaza City to Hebron, which is 70 kilometers away. And then he killed many more men single-handedly, including 1,000 men with the jawbone of a donkey. 
and Samson was witty. After killing the 1,000 men with the jawbone, he made a pun that made fools of the Philistines, claiming that with a donkey's jawbone, he made the donkeys of them. He made a heap of them. Now, this part of Samson's story is so famous in Israel that they named the place Jawbone Hill, Ramath Lee. It kind of makes you wonder why Moose Jaw is called Moose Jaw. <laughs> Samson also quoted a riddle at his uh, marriage feast. He said, out of the eater, something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet. It was a riddle that also rhymed. And the answer was, what is sweeter than honey and stronger than a lion? If you want to know the rest of the story, I encourage you to read it there in Judges 13 to 16. But he also coined the phrase, plowing with my heifer. Not sure we use that anymore, but it was popular back in the day. Yes, Samson was quick and he was strong and he was witty. But there are other aspects of Samson's story that make him an unlikely hero. Samson was set apart at birth to be a Nazarite, but he didn't act like one. A Nazarite was to be dedicated to the Lord. He, he should drink no wine, he should touch no unclean thing, and he should not cut his hair. When the Bible, the Bible says nothing about Samson drinking wine, but we certainly know that he touched unclean things. A dead lion for one, and, and many a dead man. But more than this, we know that Samson did not act like he was dedicated to the service of the Lord. Rather, he became outwardly flirtatious with the Philistines. In his youthful vigor, he determined that he would marry a Philistine girl, certainly something forbidden by Levitical law. And Samson slept with the prostitutes in Gaza, and we suspect that he slept with Delilah. Samson's actions must have grieved his parents. When Samson wanted to marry the girl in Timnah, his parents wanted to know why he would not marry one of his own people. I imagine many parents today have no less of a concern than Samson, Samson's parents about marrying an unbeliever. And Samson's actions raised the eyebrows of his countrymen. When Samson was living in the cave at Etam, the Philistines marched on the Israelites causing 3,000 Israelite men to approach Samson. And they asked him, What have you done to us? <laughs> Accusingly, they could have easily said to him, You scoundrel! Now look at the trouble you got us into! And we're left with the feeling that they did not care about Samson. Nazarite, Nazarite. A lot of good Samson is doing us. We now have the Philistines breathing down our necks. Which makes me wonder, are there any black sheep in your family? I would hazard a guess that every family here or online has a black sheep in your family. Are they flirting with the enemy? Are they doing what the Lord does not want them to do? Are they in trouble? But more importantly, how are you perceiving them? The very fact that you think of them as black sheep is indicative. Are you holding them in disdain? Are you convinced that they are lost? Back to Samson, our textual black sheep. I would hazard another guess. The Israelites figured that Samson was not good for them. I suspect that they had high hopes for this Nazarite, only to be disappointed by his actions. So when the Philistines came asking to capture Samson, well, the Israelites were obviously willing to hand him over. If they had thought that, that, that Samson could free them from oppression, if they had any hopes that Samson was their hero, they would not have come to him and asked him, what have you done to us? No, as far as the Israelites were concerned, Samson was a write-off. Samson's outward behavior and his attitude is what make him unlikely to be a hero. 
Yet somehow, Samson becomes a hero. Throughout history, since then, Samson has been in paintings by the dozens. <laughs> He's been in numerous retellings, including modern films and dramas. Samson can add to his credits the likes of Rembrandt, Michelangelo, Milton, and Handel. But part, the part of Samson's story that has made him the most famous is the part that includes Delilah. Samson and Delilah have been depicted in 19 famous paintings that I could locate online. Everybody enjoys a good love story especially a tragic one. Samson and Delilah are the Romeo and Juliet in the Bible. But in this romantic tragedy, it is only Samson who loses his life. Delilah runs away with 1,100 shekels of silver from every one of the rulers that convinced her to betray Samson. And I imagine that she also left with Samson's seven braids of hair. Samson, reduced to a bald man. I'm sure that he became the scorn of Israel. For sure, he is no Nazarite now. He has lost his locks of hair. And away into the dungeons of Philistia, Samson goes, never to be heard of again. I find it interesting that the Philistines gouged out his eyes. It seems to me that it was his eyes that got him into trouble in the first place. It was his eyes that beheld the beauty of the girl in Timnah. It was his eyes that first saw Delilah in the valley of Sorek. And it is his eyes that they gouge out. Is God trying to tell us something? through the loss of Samson's eyes? I'm not sure, but we'll ponder that another day. We'll set that aside for now. Because Samson, strong Samson, reduced being bald and blind, his strength was gone. The spirit of the Lord had left him. Samson is now a mere mortal. And the Israelites wrote him off. Well, so much for Samson. He probably got what he deserves. We are so quick to condemn. We are so quick to judge. We know what we see, and we see defeat. There's a little story about a farmer whose son broke his leg. All the neighbors said, that's too bad. When the farmer went into town, the villagers said, that's too bad. But then the army came by, drafting all able men into service. And when they came to the farmer's house and they saw the son of the broken leg, they said, that's too bad. Who are we to judge the outcome of events? Who are we to judge the outcome of other people's lives? Who are we, exactly? Who is Samson, exactly? Well, five verses into the telling of his story, the Bible says that Samson is set apart by God. And then one chapter later, we are given another clue as to how God was using Samson. In a soliloquy, it says that God was using Samson's wedding to set up a conflict with the Philistines. Ah, God. He is still in the picture. How quickly we can forget about him and his plans, especially when they don't work out the way that we planned, <laughs> the way that we planned. You see, God has other plans. His plans are greater. His plans are grander than ours. And, and just saying that and, and knowing that makes me wonder what God was up to when Trump was president of the United States. It makes me wonder what God is up to with Trudeau as our Prime Minister. And, and whether we like these gentlemen or not, that is not the question. But rather the question is, 
What is God up to? And that's what we should be leaning into. Often, we cannot see the forest for the trees, but God sees the whole earth. Isaiah 55 verse 9 says that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways, and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. So what happens next in Samson's story reveals God at work. Verse 20 of chapter 16 tells us of Samson's capture. His hair has been cut off, and it says that the Spirit of the Lord left him. All hope, if there was any, was now gone. Samson is captured, bound in bronze shackles, and his eyes are gouged out. Samson is at the end of his rope. He is at the height of his humiliation. The Philistines are celebrating their victory over Samson, and Samson is being taunted by them there in the middle of that festival. But there, in the center of Philistia, in the center of the Dagon God temple, Samson remembers the Lord God and asks God to remember him. And he prays for strength one more time. And the Spirit of the Lord comes to Samson, and Samson brings down the temple to the deaths of the 3,000 plus people that were gathered there. And the text says, Thus Samson killed many more when he died than while he lived. This is the ultimate victory for Samson, and it is what gives him hero status. And in the end, Samson was true to his identity. He began the deliverance of the Israelites from the Philistines. So, what can we learn? from Samson's story, other than being too hasty to judge people, be they black sheep or people in power. Well, I think two aspects are worth noting for sure. First, Samson is an analogy for the people of Israel. It is Israel who was set apart by God from birth since Abraham to be God's chosen people. But they, the Israelites became flirtatious with the local gods. They prostituted themselves with the neighboring nations. Israel. They were to reflect God's holiness. The whole nation was to be a Nazarite. They were to be beacons that pointed to the one true God. But they were more interested in the other nation's God than they were in their own God. Judges 13, verse 1, the introductory words to our story here tonight says, Again, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. I find it humorous that God would use a wayward Nazarite to show the people their unfaithfulness towards God. <laughs> I mean, the parallel is too coincidental to not be intentional. God was using a method to deliver them that was exactly what they were doing against God. And the lesson that we learned from this is found in our identification with the Israelites. We too have been chosen by God. We too have been set apart since birth by God. We too have been cast as the ones to be a beacon to our neighbors. Yet we too succumb to our culture. We too have forsaken our relationship with God. We too have prostituted ourselves with the ways of the world. We too have done evil in the sight of the Lord. Are we distracted from the purposes of God? Are we distracted from, from doing what the Lord has asked of us? Are we distracted from living the way that Jesus taught us to live? Are we distracted from listening to the Spirit of God within our lives? 
the silly scripture video song we heard at the beginning of the message said this, God did a mighty work through Samson, and he will do a mighty work through you. And so, if we look at our own stories, in the summation of it all, whether that's right now, or whether that's near the end of your life, in the summation of your own life, will you be true to your calling by God? The flip side that we learn from Samson's story is that God knows what he is doing. Even when, especially when, we think that he has forgotten us. God may be a God of irony. He may be a God of deliberate humor, but he is God nonetheless. God knew when he chose Samson. God knew, despite the Israelites scorning Samson. God knew when he chose you. God knew, despite you being a black sheep or not, he chose you. And it is with this in mind, that God is the one who chooses us. Even Camille said it. You didn't choose me. I chose you, Jesus said. It's with that in mind that we turn to celebrate the Lord's Supper together here today. God sent a deliverer to us to save us from distractions of the world. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who himself was a scorned Nazarite. God sent his son to save us. And in celebrating the Lord's Supper, we choose to remember and believe that Jesus is that Savior. All are welcome at the table of the Lord. All are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class. Gender nor sexuality. Politics nor religion. Personality nor nationality. Count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos. Our hatred and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blows out into the world to listen and serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. The story of Samson is a clear call for us to dedicate our lives to him, the one who provides for us, the one who protects us. We, like Samson, have been wayward, but we, like Samson, can remember the Lord our God and ask him to remember us. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, referring to the Lord's Supper. Please. Remember and know that I died for you. Please remember and know that I rose in victory for you. Please know that I am with you. And the psalmist in 103 encourages us with these words, verses 1 to 5 and 11 to 13. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth 
is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear and love him. So come. Let us remember and believe that the two elements of bread and juice of the invitation to dedicate our lives to him. And so if you have this little capsule in mind, and for you at home, if you have your bread and juice at the ready, if not, you can pause. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and having given thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take, eat, remember, and believe. Likewise, after the meal, Jesus took the cup, and having poured it, he gave thanks to God for it, and then he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is the blood of the covenant poured out for you for the complete forgiveness of all your sins, all your waywardness. Much like Psalm 103 said. So take, drink, remember, and believe that Christ's blood was poured out for you so that you would be restored back to the Father. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul.
person or those at home. Thank you so much for gathering with us. Um, your children, if you're here, you can gather them downstairs. You can pick them up from downstairs and maybe there might be some candy. I have a few tickets maybe. <laughs> but uh, one thing you should do before you depart is to, uh, to greet the mistress, to say hello to Camille and Selwa, to Charles and Christelle, and to welcome them into the river, welcome them into Edmonton, into, into Canada. It would be awesome. They'd love to see you close by. So the words coming to us as our blessing today come from 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Can you hear that? You are God's special possession that you would declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into the wonderful light. Go in his peace and in his presence.